Hello, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today for our seminar on cognitive AI benchmarking efforts in the field of perception. Today, we're joined by two very special guests, Kristen Grabman and Martin Habart, both of whom have been instrumental in defining the gold standard of what it means to build a cognitive AI benchmark. It's my distinct honor to introduce our first speaker of the day, Kristen Grabman. Kristen is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin and a research director in Facebook AI Research, or FAIR. Her research in computer vision and machine learning focuses on video, visual recognition, and action perception or embodied AI. Kristen will be joining us today to talk about her recent work on Ego4D, one of the largest egocentric data sets and benchmarks ever collected. Kristen. All right, hi everyone. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for having me be part of this workshop. Um, I'm gonna be talking about Ego4D, which is a collaborative effort with many institutions as we'll see in a minute. And this is all about first person or egocentric video. So to motivate, I wanna contrast um, egocentric perception with what is often called internet vision or the web perceptual experience. All the data sets I'm showing you here have been really influential and important for the field of computer vision giving us ways to learn models, benchmark progress on important tasks like object recognition, scene understanding, activity understanding. Um, at the same time, they have certain properties that we need to be conscious of, which is these are images and videos that are taken from a third person perspective, meaning you know someone capturing this content in an intentional way as an observer. And this means a couple of things. It means there's some intelligence built into the capture because these are moments that were curated as being important to capture by a human. Um, and it also means once we receive in our AI models these observations, they're disembodied. It means they're kind of taken out of that moment of the physical context and become these little glimpses into the visual world. So let's contrast that third person web perceptual experience with the first person or egocentric perceptual experience. Here I'm showing you a wearable camera video. Wearable cameras are egocentric. Um, taken um, in a grocery store environment by a person doing some daily life activity of shopping. And you can see, you know, these are no longer curated. We see everything that goes through the visual experience of this person. It's a long form video stream, so it's no longer curated to the nice important parts either. And really interestingly, we get this front row seat to the agent's goals, interactions, and attention. And so there's just so much here in this contrast that's important to pay attention to. It has to do with what are challenges in the video analysis that will come about because of the long form uncurated natures, but also this opportunity to really learn from the first person visual experience. And indeed in the field at large, we're seeing this very um, uh, challenging but important transition to expand from the status quo of disembodied internet images and video to this frontier of egocentric perception um, where we account for the goals, interactions, and multi-sensory observations of an agent. And this has important role as we'll see in both augmented reality and robotics. In fact, our work with ego video is motivated by on the left robot learning where you want to be able to have robots that can navigate in human spaces and manipulate human centric objects. Um, and then we have this vision of robots that will learn vicariously through our own experience before they even expend their own energy and um, power, et cetera, um, acting in the world. And on the right, in augmented reality, where we're motivated by the AR systems of the future that would provide just the right information or recommendations in the moment to a user by understanding their visual stream, both the history and what's going on now. So let's get then to the data set and benchmark ideas that we have and what we've been able to do in this project called Ego4D. And when we looked at the landscape a couple of years ago for first person video data sets, we find these inspiring works. I'm highlighting some of the representative ones um, that were capturing different forms of wearable camera data. Now at the same time, they had certain limitations in terms of their scale and their diversity. So if I'm highlighting here, what are some of the biggest ones um, on the left, the very biggest, which was Epic Kitchens containing 45 camera wares and a total of 100 hours of content captured in kitchens exclusively. And in, in general, we saw a limitation in the variety of subjects, the variety of environments, and just the pure scale of these data sets. And so we take them as inspiration, but in Ego4D, we're trying to really venture very far in each of these dimensions, the amount of data, 
the variety of the location and also the people and what they're doing in the video. So we've you know, come a long way in the last two plus years in this project. In fact, if you carve out a rectangle showing Epic, that largest data set of kitchens that I referred to a second ago, um, on the vertical axis in terms of number of participants, remember it was 45, and on the horizontal axis for the number of hours, which was 100, this is the scale of the data that was available. If you combine up all of the prior egocentric video data sets from the last 12 or so years, you'd get this magnitude. And now to show you Ego4D, this is where we land when we introduced this data set um, just about a year and a half ago. And uh, it's order of magnitude leap in scale and diversity. So we have more than 3,000 hours of content in the wild, unscripted daily life actions. It's captured by nearly a thousand different unique individuals who um, were wearing cameras in 74 different worldwide locations. The data set is multimodal. So video is a core part, but there's also audio, some 3D scans, IMU, stereo, and multi-camera capture. And with the data set, very importantly, is not just this repository of interesting video, but also um, by the research team, a suite of research benchmark tasks. So tasks that are meant to span what's important to pay attention to and first person video understanding and formal challenges and annotations that go with them to allow benchmark progress, benchmarking progress in the field. So the diversity of this data came about in part because we had a wonderful consortium of collaborating institutions together with FAIR um, that came together for this project. And I'm highlighting them all here. And what you can see is this means we have both world leading experts in video from the many universities I'm showing here, um, as well as a good step towards geographic diversity because the people and the teams that were collecting this data were looking to the local community for people wearing the cameras, which means geographically um, people that contribute to Ego40 are in these many places in the world. In fact, some nine different countries, five continents, and as I mentioned, 74 different locations. Now the people wearing the cameras themselves were also diverse. So here I'm highlighting what was the distribution of gender as well as the geograph geographic layout in the circle here. And then in the bar chart, we're looking at age. So the people wearing the cameras, you know, in past data sets, this would very often be grad students. Um, but here we have both in age and occupation a much wider diversity from aged 18 to 84 years old. And then in occupation, as you see in the world, word cloud, you have everything from chefs, landscapers, farmers, teachers, mechanics, etc., who are giving this data a really fascinating glimpse of daily life activity um, in occupations that require, require very different visual experiences, as we'll see in a second. So this is exciting for the diversity angle, and I wanted to stop here, pause here, and show you a short video interview excerpt from a number of people trying to answer this question, why did you participate in Ego4D? Um, I thought it would be a bit of fun. Me pareció muy chévere poder eh, mostrar o ayudar a visibilizar eh, actividades cotidianas de eh, países como Colombia que, nos, que son subrepresentadas en muchas bases de datos actuales que se utilizan. Uh, Ho deciso proprio perché è animato un po' da questa passione verso la scienza, questa considerazione fruibile dell'arte verso la scienza di una, una possibilità. I think uh, participating in uh, evolving of science is quite important. I really like science and I love to help. I thought the whole cause of the data and what you guys were trying to do with it seemed very interesting and very cool to help out with. I believe it's always uh, amazing to be at the center of uh, cutting edge uh, research. La inclusión. La inclusión de todos los países, de diferentes culturas, de diferentes personas, y que realmente este proyecto va a contribuir a la disminución de esos sesgos que existen por cómo se recogen los datos que siempre son en los mismos países. Okay, so you get a glimpse there of some of the camera wearers among those 931 folks and why they were willing to, you know, participate in this project and wear a camera. Okay, so what cameras did they wear? 
um, we decided as a consortium to use a variety of cameras. The idea was let's not overfit the future or the next you know, years of egocentric video research on a particular device, but rather let's have some bit of ver variety in there. A lot of the video is from GoPro, which is the camera on the left. There's also Vuzix Blade, Pupil Lab, Z-Shade, WeView, and these have different trade-offs in terms of battery life and multi the multiple sensing that they can do. So what did people do in this video? Now, the whole point was to not script anything. So this wasn't the kind of data set where we wanted to say, okay, we'd like to get clips of people, you know, um, walking the dog now, would you walk your dog? It was more, let's get the cameras into hands of people who by their natural daily life activity are going to be doing a variety of interesting things that then can be present in a very natural way in this data. So from the bottom up. Now that said, we knew we wanted to have this data represent the kind of things that would support learning for robot learning, as I mentioned earlier, as well as augmented reality, kind of the things that people will be doing in daily life and that we wish robots or AR assistants to know about. And so this is just a, a smattering of the kind of activities that according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, we play, we people, people in the US are spending most of our time doing across everyday activities at home, errands, work, leisure, exercise, transportation. And so again, we got unscripted capture of as many of these things as we could just by getting the cameras into many different people's hands um, and having them go about their daily life activity. So finally, you know, what does this data look like? Here I'm showing you tiny excerpts from what are often, you know, eight minute to one hour captures from a given individual at a time, just kind of limited by the battery of the device. And you can see that there's people doing a lot of interesting hand object manipulations in different settings. It's indoor, it's outdoor. Um, the climates will be different, whether you're in Minnesota over here or in uh, Sicily over there. You have solitary activities, but you also have activities with others, social interactions, um, activities that take place in public spaces like shopping, in the home, and even some interactions with animals. You can see the diversity in occupation that I mentioned earlier. Um, from people doing daily life activity that requires um, using different kinds of objects or in different kinds of settings. Again, some social, here's some more interesting occupation work. And a lot of this data was captured, um, well, between the span of early 2020 to mid 2021. And so they also see some elements playing out in terms of distribution of data from um, where, not just where people were, but also what the, the pandemic situation was too. So I hope this gives you a good glimmer of you know, what it looks like around the world according to Ego40. Let me then speak a little bit more about the modalities in the data. So we've seen some video samples, but I also mentioned there's 3D scans. So for a subset of the data, you have a 3D scan of the full environment. So a static capture of the full reconstruction of the space, as you can see in the top row here. And that means you have links between dynamic ego video, like these clips on the bottom, and their trajectories through these 3D spaces. And this has the potential for widening a lot of research that would be more 3D centric about uh, in the context of dynamic activities. Other modalities, well, on the left, there's a certain part of the capture where everyone in the space is wearing a camera. And so you have the simultaneous synchronized views of their perspectives at once. And on the right, for a portion of the data, there's also eye gaze captured. Um, here from Indiana University, and that gives an, an interesting signal to explore for the attention of the person wearing the camera. And then the other modality I wanted to highlight here is text, because the very first thing we did as we amassed this, you know, these thousands of hours of content was to get them annotated with natural language descriptions. And we call these narrations. And you're seeing examples of them here on the video on the left, where the white text, these are narrations. So C means camera wear. And so we're saying things like C closes the bottle, C picks up the saw, C puts the saw on the plank, et cetera, like very step-by-step -step descriptions of what the camera wearer's activity is. And this was done densely. So this step-by-step -step meant on average, people gave us about 13 sentences per minute. And think of it as just a parallel stream of data for this video that allows um, for us to do things like mine for taxonomies of objects and actions, or just index into the data according to the activities that are present, and has since been used by many other researchers in the field to do some multimodal learning from the video and text. All right, so from the very beginning, the privacy and ethics of this capture was at the forefront. 
And that's what's really important, you know, what's also really important alongside the scale and diversity of this data is the fact it was captured in a very rigorous way as far as um, privacy ethics review. And that meant IRBs at each institution before they started collecting data, consent forms were relevant, and de-identification of the data were relevant according to those parameters. So, you know, I've talked then mostly about the data and the remainder, let me say a few things about the benchmarks that come with EGO4D. So just as important as having rich natural data for researchers to get their hands on is also to start to put forward the challenges that will guide the research with this um, form of video in the years to come. And so for this purpose, the team put together five benchmark tasks and they move from the past to the present to the future of understanding the first person visual experience. From the past, this is our episodic memory benchmark, where you can ask questions about what happened and where things were looking at a long history of video content. In the present, we have benchmark tasks that look at what the user is doing now. So hand and object manipulation being a very important part of that, as well as social aspects of the present, like audiovisual diarization diarization, who said what, and then social interaction, who is looking at the camera where, who's talking to the camera where. And then into the future, we want, um, we have a task and a set of tasks that look at forecasting. So being able to say not just what you're doing now, but anticipate what actions are likely to happen next. And all of these have been formalized. We, we um, put together more than 250,000 hours of annotator time in order to get benchmarks set up for both training and evaluating these tasks in a rigorous way. And in fact, we've run at this point three different challenges in the research community where researchers come and um, tackle these challenges and get evaluated. We have leaderboards and um, you know, servers to, to evaluate these very formally on held out test sets so that we can mark the progress in the field. And what's really exciting on the left, right, you can see that among these three challenges we've done so far, um, more and more people are getting involved. So most recently we had a three X increase from last year to this year for the previous challenge to this one and more than 60 teams around the world who are competing on these challenges. And it's important to know these are teams that are um, mix of industry and academic, in fact, dominated by academic led teams participating in the challenge. And it's important to note because yes, it's a huge data set and um, kind of brings the scale to this new level, but also um, because of the way we've presented it and the challenges and what tools are available, we're finding that the academic teams, not just bigger industry labs, are able to really start making things happen with this data. And what's happening with this data is not limited to computer vision. So this is where you know the, the folks that came together to make this research come from with the vision field. Um, but by looking at the early distribution of citations to Eagle 4D, um, we're seeing that there's uptake that's very interesting across not just vision, but also machine learning, robotics, multimedia, psychology, and linguistics. And so what's next? Um, this consortium is continuing to grow and um, has a new mission building on Eagle 4D that uh, is looking at the relationship between first and third person perspectives. And this is motivated, um, I think important for this audience, you know, in terms of developmental learning, thinking of how we start to build up this ability to map the actions of others onto ourselves, as well as applications in robotics and AR, like I've already alluded to, where we wanna be able to transfer skill between a demonstrator we see um, and an agent. It also has this ability to bring in um, in our Ego Exo Capture, which is this ongoing new effort, um, both third and first person cameras so that we can do reconstruction. We can have strong 3D measurements of the scene and the actors and the objects. Um, and I'm showing you samples from this ongoing effort and the current consortium looking at Ego Exo Capture in both skilled and procedural activities, which is the focus now for this collection. Okay, um, so finally, Ego 40 Computer Vision is the home, but it's finding it, uh, we hope to support and find good um, use and uh, practical impact for robotics, speech, language, AR, audio, and 3D sensing as well. And finally, it closed here um, with this slide, recognizing the team that put together Ego 40, um, which is uh, 84 different people, as you can see listed here from the 13 different institutions shown below. All right, thanks so much for your attention and I will stop here. Glad to have our discussion coming up.